Welcome to the Pink Tax Podcast, a no-nonsense podcast for millennial women, building wealth and smashing the patriarchy, one dollar at a time, with your hosts, Janine and Tara. Hey, Tara. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. How do you feel about talking about credit cards today? Oh, I have so much to say, so we should probably get started. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, first question to you, opinions on credit cards. Good? Bad? Both? (laughs) I think it depends kind of what you're using them for. I've always been an advocate of being able to utilize, you know, credit card points and travel rewards and cash back, but at the same time, you can't let your credit cards kind of get out of control and get Mm -hmm. to the point where you're not paying them off every month because then I don't think those benefits are worth it. Exactly. Same. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And you had mentioned in one of our earlier episodes about the consumer debt sign. So if you were to wear your debt number... How much do you think um, lack of knowledge about using your credit cards wisely affects that consumer debt sign? I think it affects it quite heavily. I know there are a lot of people that get in over their heads, especially when they're younger, maybe not understanding how credit cards work. There seems to always be credit card applications at post-secondary institutions, you know, when it's the first week of school and maybe financial literacy hasn't been taught to a lot of these individuals in their life. And I guess signing up for, you know, $10,000 or $5,000 and thinking you can just spend it without understanding how much you're going to have to pay off or, um, you know, what that means for your credit score, I think can be very overwhelming. How old were you when you got your first credit card? I was 18. How about you? I think I was 18 as well. And I think I maybe was approved for like $1,000. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty normal. And I really do think it's a good thing to get, you know, a $500 or $1,000 credit card when you're 18 and use that to learn how to use credit, build up a credit score. So when you're ready to get um, a loan, a car loan, you know, your house, everything like that, you've already built up a solid credit base. Yeah. And one of the questions I always get, which I'm curious on what your thoughts are on this is there are people that, you know, maybe put $300 worth of groceries on their credit card Mm -hmm. and then on their way home from the grocery store, they're already on their online bank transferring that $300 to the the credit card because they don't ever want to to carry Mm -hmm. a balance. Yeah, that's, not really doing anything for you except creating more work. Um, So maybe let's get into like how credit cards work. Um, You get a grace period. The grace period varies. It's usually around 21 days um, based on your billing cycle. So you don't have to pay that off until you get the statement in your email or in the regular mail um, and the due date. So you get to carry whatever that is, interest-free, Um, so it can really help with your cash flow too. So don't pay it off. Um, the minute that you spend on your credit card, it's not doing anything for you. It's not improving your credit score. Uh, yeah, it's not a great way to use your credit card. I would definitely agree with that. And if we can jump into credit scores a little bit, Mm -hmm. I think it's something that a lot of people are concerned with, which is interesting Mm -hmm. to me because I don't really think it's that important unless you're trying to take on more debt. But maybe we can dive into how that is affected and calculated with your your credit cards. Sure. Yeah. And so I do think like um, your credit score is a good part of like overall financial health. Um, So first, my question to you is when you were 18 and got your first credit card, what did you know about credit scores? Zero. Zero. Yeah, same. (laughs) Zero. Uh, Never really thought about it until, yeah, I needed to take out more credit and even then you know um just wasn't a thing so yeah let's talk about what goes into building up a credit score so the big pieces the two uh biggest pieces that go into uh 
what your credit score is calculated on are repayment history and the amount, the ratio of debt to credit. So how much you've been extended. So your credit limit on your card. So let's say your first card, a thousand bucks and how much you've actually used of that. So let's say you're using 70%, that's $700. Yeah. So credit utilization. Exactly. Yeah. In a sense. Mm -hmm. And how does that negatively or positively impact? Do you want a high credit utilization? Do you want a low credit utilization? You want somewhere in the middle. So um, you'll often hear like rule of thumb is 50%. In actuality, it's somewhere between 30 and 70%. Um, And it also depends on when your credit gets pulled in the cycle. So if you're thinking, oh, on average, I never go over 50%, but like one day of the month, you have maxed out your credit card, Um, If that's when uh, Equifax or TransUnion decides to take the data or your credit card decides to send the data, it looks like you're you're maxing out your credit card. That's not great. That will negatively impact your credit score for sure. Um, So I would say, you know, at and like pick a number between 30 and 70 percent of your credit limit. Um, So, again, if you have a thousand bucks, that's somewhere between 300 and 700 dollars. Never go over that. Your limit is now $700. Don't go over it because you never know when the data is going to be sent. So it's kind of like setting a soft limit for yourself Mm -hmm. to know that it won't affect your credit score. And I guess that kind of talks to my earlier point on if you pay off your credit card every time you put something on it, there's not Mm -hmm. going to be anything. There's no data. Yeah, you're not even going to be at the 30% and there's going to be nothing Mm -hmm. for them to pull. So what's the highest credit score you can get? 900. So and that's the lowest a, is three. Okay. 100. So 600 is kind of right in the middle of that. And so. Yeah. I mean, you want something over 700 for sure. If you're um, looking for lower interest rates or being able to carry um, or, or be extended higher credit limits for sure. Um, 600 is fine. 500 and less. I would say you're not going to get a regular lender to look at you. Um, 300, you've probably declared bankruptcy or you have collections out on you. It's tough to get a 300. It's tough to get a 900. Yeah. I found when I was starting to be interested in personal finance, there wasn't really the ability, unless you paid for it to get your credit score in Canada, it Mm -hmm. was just a credit report. Mm -hmm. And now there is a lot of tools and technologies out there that are allowing Canadians to get their credit score. Mm -hmm. So that's been something that I've been able to do for free, but maybe we could chat quickly about uh, the difference between that credit uh, report versus an actual credit score. Yeah. So the credit score is good to know. Um, It's kind of an easy way to judge your history as well, but the credit report is just as important Um, because like what we said at the beginning, um, 30 ish percent of your score is the repayment history. 30 ish percent of the score is the credit that you're carrying the debt to credit ratio. Um, so going and digging deep into why you have a 600 is super important. Did you have an 800 and have you been missing payments or overextending, like going over your credit limit or getting or maxing out cards? Um, and now you're at a 600, that's really important. That's not a great trend. Um, or did you start at a 500 and now you've built it up because now you have good repayment history, um, and you're using a good ratio of your limit. And one thing I think is very important from that credit report standpoint is making sure you understand what accounts are even open in your name. Mm -hmm. I know with all of these like hacks that have been happening over the past, you know, five, six years, it's important to know if someone's opening accounts in your name, like an identity fraud perspective. And I think credit reports definitely outline which accounts you have open, or maybe Mm -hmm. I've also had banks, I've gone to close the the credit card. Mm -hmm. And they have not closed the credit card. And then, you know, there's a fee associated with it. And 
I obviously assumed the card was closed. And so this bad fee kind of perpetuates and then that hurts your credit score as well. Yeah. And I think, um, with having open credit facilities that you're not using too, um, it's just lowering your maximum amount of credit that can be extended to you. You know, everybody is given a number. Nobody knows what it is, but you're kind of given a number, um, based on your score and your history of how much total credit you can have and based on your income as well. So if you have an open $10,000 credit card that you're not using, um, that's only hurting you. So you might as well close it. And what do you think about, I've heard people be worried about closing credit cards um, that they've had for a long time. You want to keep your longest uh history. Um, it is a small part of your credit score. Um, but again, it's not super important. So if your first credit card didn't come with points, it has no, um, large benefit for you using it and you're not using it that much. And it's only a year or two, uh, more history than your other credit facility, be it a car loan or, uh, another credit card, any of those things then you can close it. But if you have a card that you um, have good history with, you've had it for 10 years, and your other cards, you've only had it for a year, I would start to sort of wean yourself off of the old card until you've built up three to five years of history with the newer cards or or lines of credit. That's That's a really good rule of thumb because I think a lot of us, you know, that first credit card we get is kind of shitty. In the <laughs> yeah, sense you're not that you get a good one. No, you're gonna get either some student card or mm-hmm. something that gives you terrible points. I remember my first one; I got like RBC points, and you can't do anything with RBC points. It was yeah. ridiculous. Um, you could like buy jewelry or something from the RBC store, but it was so mm-hmm. limited; like it was mm-hmm. insane. And once I kind of started to get into the personal finance realm, I realized that oh, okay, there's a lot of better cards oh, yeah. out there. Yeah. And so I think to our listeners, don't be scared to close that first credit card once you have built up some history on another card. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, to that point as well, like once you've had your first card, once you've um, used it wisely, that kind of thing, and you're opening up more facilities, be aware that uh, the type of credit you're opening also has an impact. Um, so when I'm saying, you know, use 30 to 70% of your available credit limit, that doesn't count for, um, your, uh, phone bill will report to your credit report. Most, um, most phone companies are doing that now. That doesn't count. Um, uh, any kind of installment loans, your car loan, that doesn't count. No one expects you to only use 70% of your car loan. You're, you're paying it off. You're not getting access to that again. Um, and mortgages you're not only using 70% of your mortgage as you pay it off, you reduce access to it. So if you only have like three credit cards and two lines of credits, um, and you don't have anything that's kind of a closed installment type loan, um, you might be negatively impacting yourself on that regard as well. That's kind of weird that you're negatively affected because you don't have an additional loan. Yeah, and I mean, you can get, you won't get a 900, but you can get an 800 with only having two or three different types of uh, credit facilities. So you can get a nine, or you can get an 800 with uh, a phone bill, a couple of credit cards, and a car loan or a mortgage, that kind of thing. You don't necessarily need to have all the types, but to have 15 years of history with only one type, um, and maybe not such good reporting, it, it can negatively impact you. It's a small, small percent. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's less than 10% of your score is uh, impacted by the different types of facilities that you have. Now I really want a 900, just, just to know. say I have it. It's very difficult to get a 900. It's super difficult to get I'll a report back if I uh, end up getting a 900. Yeah. I doubt it. But Do you know what your credit score is? I don't off the top of my head, but every month I use uh, BorrowWell to send me uh, okay. a notification and it just pops up with, um, you know, your credit score has increased or decreased. And it, mm-hmm. it is interesting to go in and kind of see what, why it has increased or decreased. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. because I put a lot on my credit card for work travel. I mm-hmm. think 
at the time of recording this, I, I just have gotten a mortgage. So I'm actually mm-hmm. really curious to see this month how it's going to be affected yeah. with that mortgage coming into play. I feel like it'll probably go down, but... Oh, I, I, would, I would think it's going to go up. Um, in my experience, mortgages and car loans are great for your credit really? score. How hard is it now? I mean, not 20 years ago, but now. How hard is it to miss... Uh, a car loan payment or a mortgage payment. That's true. It's incredibly difficult because they're getting your banking information right off the hop. It's all automated. So unless you haven't really budgeted for it and you're, you're at risk of default, which is horrible. Um, please don't do that. Uh, it's great. You're going to show great repayment history. You're going to show that you paid it off with within the allotted amount of time. Right? So if you have a five year car loan, that's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful for you. Yeah. I think going back to credit scores, the highest I think I remember mine being at one point was 840. And I think it's fluctuated over the years between 750 and 840. So I Mm -hmm. think like that is where I don't really focus on it too much because it's, you know, in that higher 700s, low 800s. So, but now I really want a 900. (laughs) Let me know if you get there. Um, or how close you get. Yeah, I know um, mine is definitely over 800. Uh, and once you get a good one and know how to maintain it, it is really difficult to, to negatively impact it. So now when I'm pulling my, cre- my own credits uh, every year just to check what's going on, um, it, it's, I'm just looking for unusual, uh, unusual credit pulls. So the top of your credit report, you should be able to see your information um, your recent address information, also good to see because that's the last pull um, of the creditor where they had your address listed. So if you've always lived in Calgary your entire life and all of a sudden you see an Ontario address on there, that should be a red flag to you. Um, then next comes the inquiries. So you can see car dealerships, banks, um, all of those kind of things. If you see something on a list, um, and it's unfamiliar to you, that can be a red flag. Yeah, definitely call your, uh, like Equifax or TransUnion mm-hmm. when you see those things, because you, it's important to get them sorted out sooner rather than later, or you will find yourself with a really low credit score. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And if somebody manages to open something under your name, um, they're not going to pay, they're not going to pay for it. No, they're definitely not planning on paying that off. Yeah. And, uh, a few your credit score now saying oh if you have a good credit score it is difficult to uh, get a low one however uh, missed payments uh, can negatively impact your score by up to 100 points wow so you miss a payment for more than 30 days more than 60 days more than 90 days you can go from a 700 to a 600 Um, if you start to default yeah you're going to go down to 300 real quick if you have one uh, credit card that has to be sold to somebody else. So if you ha- go to collections, you're going to get a 300. That's scary. So mm-hmm. definitely try and avoid that and yeah. you know manage those that credit card and your repayments on that credit mm-hmm. card as well. Um, something I wanted to talk about, too many credit cards. You can have too many credit cards if you're not using them. If you're using them, if it's working for you, if you're not overextending them, great but understand that you do have a maximum amount of credit that will be allotted to you. Um, I don't think anybody could split, let's say your maximum is $10,000 that you could have in credit cards. You split that over six cards. It's probably, yeah, it's just a headache. I would say three is manageable. Um, The number of inquiries can affect your credit score. Um, so that's like if people are following you around in Walmart or I shouldn't use real names, but if they're following you around in a store asking for you to, you know, just apply, I just need your ID. They're going to pull your credit. If you don't want a credit card, don't let people pull your credit. The ones in the airport are so bad too. There's always like a booth to sign up and Mm -hmm. I feel like stop, like stop following people around to get credit. But I mean, Mm -hmm. the companies make so much money on it. So yeah, you have to use a system that works for you. I think. I think I have three cards. One of them I don't use except for it's an Amex. So if there's like a concert or something that I can get in, like an Amex only thing, Mm. that is when I use that one. But that one has no annual fee or anything like that. Just be aware um, that they are pulling your credit. And each inquiry, if it does count towards uh, your credit score, can be up to five points. So 
if each of those seven pulls that day, um, it's five points each pull. So 35 in total. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in one day. So that's That's insane. But then again, one 30-day late payment could be 100 points. So just pay on time. And don't go test driving. And don't go test for driving. For fun. Exactly. It's not a good date night. Um, yeah, so then... Uh, that's what affects your credit score. So know your score, know your history, make your payments on time. Um, don't carry more than 70% of your uh, balance on lines of credits or uh, credit cards. And then, yeah, credit card strategy. So I have four credit cards. Okay, tell me about and them. And I use three regularly. And one, which I don't advocate for, is one of those store cards. Um, specifically for home improvements. So everybody knows what that one is. And it's because I like that 18 months, no interest, but also really hard to navigate. If you don't know exactly how to do that, don't do that. Um, and maybe we can go into that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, the three that we use, um, we have different cash back levels on each of them. So we have, we pay for gas with one, we pay for rent restaurants with another and uh, our one that's like straight across the board points back or cash back rather. Um, we use that for everything else. Everything else that's not a high uh, cash back category. So we have a 4% category, 2% categories and 1.5%. Um, 1.5% we use for everything that's not a 2% or a 4%. And that's just how it is. But I guess what I will share is um, some of those do come with fees. Um, fees can be worth it if you are getting enough in cash back and if you are paying off the full balance at the end of every month. Yeah, for sure. And I know, is it either, it's either lowest rates or rate hub. One of those two has a really great calculator Mm -hmm. that allows you to see if you're going to be getting back more from that credit card than you're paying yeah. Um, in an annual fee. So it's really important to run the math on that and understand, you know, if you're going to be paying $120 for a credit card, you better mm-hmm. damn well be getting more than $120 cash back. Exactly. Exactly. And you have to know that um, up front. And I think both of us have mentioned cash back cards. I imagine your cards are cash back. Yes. One of them is, one of them is more of a travel, um, travel cash back in terms of dollars to spend a, on a specific mm-hmm. airline. Okay. Yeah. And that's not bad either because it converts to cash. Pretty much. Yeah. I've had some experience with credit cards that are in in a sense travel points, Mm -hmm. but I found over the years, those travel points have started to lose value. You know, a credit card company will be like, and we're not making enough money. So these points are now Mm -hmm. worth less. And it was really frustrating Mm -hmm. being in that because we had all these points saved up and we thought, you know, this is what the value of those points are. We're going to go on this great trip. And then the financial institution changed the value of the points. So yeah. that would be one area in terms of strategy. I would say cash back or cash back like things yes. are probably your best bet. And I would say the same things too, because you see that in the department store cards um, and the grocery store cards, those kind of things. The points fluctuate for what you can get with them. It's not a straight cash conversion um, and it's not a set cash conversion usually. So I just avoid those. It's not worth the headache of trying to calculate what my 10 points is actually equivalent to. Um, But I have seen credit card companies getting a little bit better where they'll say you can have it in points and use it to buy or you can have it applied to your credit card. I prefer the ones that actually allow you to put it into your savings account or your checking account or your investment accounts. I, I much prefer those. Absolutely. We use one that is deposited into our savings account and Mm -hmm. that's how we bolster our travel fund. Yeah. So in a sense, it is kind of like cash back for travel because Mm -hmm. we're utilizing those points to go on a trip. And I mean, you could do the same with like an extra debt payment on a mortgage if that was something that you were focusing on. So getting that cash actually in your hand as opposed to having it applied to your statement, I think yeah. is is the way to go. Yeah, I prefer that too. And what's interesting now that I think about it, the we have one fee-based card, so we pay an annual fee on one of them, and that's the one where we can only use the cash back to the credit card itself. The other two can be deposited to any of our accounts. Interesting. Yeah, strange. Um, okay, so that's good 
strategy. Oh, we got a question about um, do the points or cash back affect your credit history in any way? And that is a big no, unless I guess you're applying it to your balance every month, in which case it can because it lowers your uh, credit to debt ratio. Yeah, that would be the only way I, it could affect it is if it was yeah being applied to your credit card or if you took that money and you know made an extra debt payment mm-hmm. or were able to make a payment on a card that you were going to default on. Yeah. So really, I guess only if you're in a negative financial situation could those points help you out. But mm-hmm. in terms of just getting them and accruing those points, they're not going to do anything for you yeah. from a credit score perspective. Yeah. Um, and since we're talking about um, credit and credit scores, do you ever think that it's a good idea for somebody to co-sign with you? That's an interesting question that I haven't really thought about. I think if you're co-signing with someone, you have to be willing to take on the responsibility of that full card mm-hmm. and understand that you might have to pay it all back or it could like really negatively affect your score. I don't know if I ever would. I don't I don't feel like I would ever be in a situation where I would need to co-sign someone because if they were in a position where they couldn't get a credit card, Mm -hmm. I would probably be wanting to have a conversation around why that was the case and what I can do to help them as opposed to enabling maybe bad behavior. Maybe a a kid that was traveling abroad with like Mm -hmm. a school trip, Mm -hmm. maybe, but then I guess wouldn't you just give them like uh, make them like an, an additional user on your credit card. Mm-hmm. If, if that was the case, like if you needed it for emergencies to be able to get a flight back or something, I could see that, yeah. but yeah, I don't think I would. Yeah. And so, um, my dad co-signed on my very first car loan. So before actually I had a credit card, um, my dad co-signed on a car loan. And like I had mentioned, uh, car loans are great. Car loans are great. You don't miss a payment. You don't do anything like that. I was a student. I had no income. Um, but he co-signed on it and it was a great benefit to my credit score early on. So he was obviously aware, but unless it's a kid for me, that's the only time I would co-sign too. And in terms of authorized users, definitely only make a trusted person an authorized user. So for married couples, you can both be liable on the credit card and be co-sign co-borrowers in that sense, or you can have an authorized user Authorized users don't necessarily have the same um, respect for your credit score than you and credit history than you do. And one thing I wanted to mention about authorized user authorized users is that if you're in a relationship and you are sharing a credit card, it's important to make sure that both individuals have a card in their name. Yes. Because otherwise you can get into the situation where if I have all three of the credit cards in the household Mm -hmm. and my husband is the authorized user on all of them, he's not getting any benefit to his credit score at all because they're all in my name. Yeah. And so if the one partner has used their income um, and their credit to do the mortgage and not the other person's credit, if they have done all the credit cards and the other person is just the authorized user, they do all the car loans, everything like that, it may seem easy from the person who is not using their credit. Maybe they don't have income, so they don't even know if they can qualify. Definitely even have a low, low, low limit credit card in your name because if anything were to happen, uh, separation or, or loss of your partner, you need to have a credit history. Everybody needs to have a credit history. A hundred percent. So yeah, make sure that you know you're having a, a credit card in each of your names in your mm-hmm. in your partnership, and do only allow really trusted people. If you are allowing a kid on your credit card, I think it's really important for them to understand mm-hmm. the implications it could have for you if they don't, yeah. if they rack it up like crazy, yeah. or if they don't have the money to pay it off. Like what that means to you as a parent. And kids can get um, prepaid credit cards too. So they are they don't impact your credit score. They have nothing to do with borrowing history. It just gives you a credit card number. So it gives you the ability to pay for online subscriptions or emergencies out of country or out of province or what have you. Um, but they're prepaid. So you load it up with $500. You let the kid have access to it. It doesn't impact anybody's credit, but it can be used in any situation a credit card can be used in. And that's probably a good way to start teaching a kid how to appropriately use a credit card for spending. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because it is, 
you are going to have to pay for it eventually, usually at the end of the month. I usually say a credit card is meant for payments that you can pay at the end of the month. If there's something that you need to carry, like that is not the loan you want. They're usually 20% interest. You can get lower interest levels, but um, even then the lower interest credit cards usually don't make as much sense as the line of credit or a loan. For sure. And one thing I did want to mention, because it, it's been challenging here in Canada for me around credit cards, is the foreign uh, transaction fees oh, yeah. on credit cards. I think there is a financial institution that's going to be coming out with that, a credit card coming up here with no uh, fin- with no like conversion fee. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. That that 2% or whatever that they tack on. And mm-hmm. for a long time, my husband and I were using that Amazon card. It was free. Oh, yeah. And we would use it only for travel. But they closed that down. So I'm kind mm-hmm. of at a loss in terms of what credit cards are even available in Canada right now for with no fees. But that is something that if, you're, if you do a lot of travel, which we do, we're always in the States or in Europe or wherever... That 2% can add up. It does, especially if you're using multiple transactions. So when we travel um, overseas, uh, we usually do cash. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's a lower fee for us just to take out more euro or whatever at the bank, uh, converting just from our Canadian account to euro. Um, you can get USD credit cards if you're traveling a lot. Yeah, we definitely have a USD credit card. Um, I guess, I, yeah, I'm talking more about Europe. But do you then pull out all your cash before you go and then carry around? No, okay. no, no. Good. I was like, <laughs> yeah. And we used to have a bank that was more international, but again, those are hard to come by these days. So if you can get, um, at least an account at an institution that has access to international ABMs or an international ABM rate, um, that's a little bit better or just go with your, um, yeah, I don't know. Go with your debit card and, and hope for the best. Or your, I guess maybe look into time. what the, the transaction fee for those prepaid cards is. That could be another mm-hmm. solution. Yeah. But yeah, just be mindful that that is something that will increase the cost of things. And if you're doing yeah. a big Europe trip, 2% can add up yeah. in a hurry. Yeah. And it, like, yeah, you, I use my credit card as a debit card, basically. So usually for spending, you know, I'm using it multiple times a day. And if you're traveling, you're breakfast lunch and dinner plus shopping and touristy things right so you could be using it 10 times a day two percent on each transaction yeah it adds up quick for sure Mm -hmm. yeah cool and just gonna double check i think we covered everything that i wanted to cover and if any of our listeners have more questions definitely send them our way and our pink tax rebate for this episode would be uh, take a look at your credit history, pull it, um, get rid of any cards that aren't working for you. If it's not worth it to have it on your bureau, get rid of it. Um, If you're spending more than 70% of your limit, up your limit or decrease your spending on it. And that's it. Get your credit report and know your history. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. As always, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave a five-star review. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to share your money story using the hashtag FemFinances. 